Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Jerry, Your Excellency. In a few moments, I'm going to ask Jerry Cohen to introduce uh, the president. And you know that in the United States, once a president, always a president. <laughs> but I want to say a few general things about the context in which this uh, fireside chat will take place. So two things from American life. In two or three weeks, there will be the World Series to decide the baseball champion in the United States. It's the World Series in which teams from two countries participate. Let's face it, let's admit it. In many of its cultural aspects, the United States is a parochial country where the world is between the Pacific and the Atlantic. But that is not true of New York University. It's not true of the university, which has campuses from Florence to Shanghai. And it's not true of New York University School of Law, which pioneered the concept of the global law school, and which we have institutes such as this, founded by Jerry Cohen and Frank Appam, to underline our commitment, our interest in things that even happen beyond our shores. So it's really wonderful to see a full room for an occasion such as this. The second thing, it's from today's New York Times. I took a screenshot. Bear with me one second. This is in today's New York Times, a very big headline. The US can still avoid war with China over Taiwan. Yes, we know that's a very important issue, but it's part of this American parochialism that the only thing that we tend to think about when we speak of Taiwan is the possible war between China and the United States. There's much more to Taiwan than that issue. To learn from them, I've had two doctoral students, my own doctoral students from Taiwan, and I learned a lot about that country. And there is a few more interesting things that happen in Taiwan that are about Taiwan, apart from the geopolitical uh, issue. So <clears throat> it's my honor now, and I apologize, I have to immediately run and teach a class very non-parochial, legal controls of digital platforms. Uh, and I'm going to invite Jerry Cohen to introduce His Excellency President Ma. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, this is a great day for NYU, and I hope a great day for U.S.-Taiwan mainland China relations. No subject could be more important, even though at the moment we're understandably preoccupied not only with Israel-Gaza, but also Ukraine-Russia. But everyone who looks at those events sees the implications possible for Taiwan because they know if we mess up our relations with Taiwan and the mainland, it could be nuclear war. Very, very serious. So I was thrilled when I heard that uh, President Ma was coming back. He was here some years ago. He gave three talks in New York that made a deep impression. But we never followed up with it. And I hope today will be different. I hope today will lead to a continuing dialogue, discussion, exchanges, research, ideas about the subject of cross-strait relations and Taiwan uh, generally. We couldn't have a better person to stimulate this interest than President Ma. He's done it all, his life since he came here 50 years ago as a student at NYU has been the embodiment 
of the modernization of Taiwan and Chinese political legal culture. And he went back and became Deputy Secretary General of the Kuomintang, which was just stirring, trying to modernize in accordance with current values. He was Minister of Justice after being in the legislature. And then, of course, he became mayor of Taipei. And by the time he was mayor of Taipei, the mainland people knew that he was a magnet for trying to talk about how to solve cross-strait relations. And I remember organizing a conference about 25 years ago where I wanted people from the mainland to come. And they all said, if Ma comes, we'll come. And he did. He came for three days, even while mayor. And then, of course, he became the president of Taiwan, and he did some remarkable things. I think we have to reevaluate his experience because he did what the mainland said couldn't be done. The mainland always said, we will never negotiate with Taiwan as an equal. Taiwan is a mere province of China. How does the central government discuss anything on an equal basis with Taiwan? But he did it and made over 20, I think there were 23 agreements on everything, including criminal justice. I remember how happy he was when the criminal justice agreement led to the return to Taiwan of many people Taiwan wanted to prosecute for various offenses. So this was a wonderful time. It's a time we somehow have to build upon. I hope that the mainland will resume relationships with Taiwan authorities. It suspended them in 2016. And I hope that that criminal justice agreement will be resurrected also. We need more contact. And I hope the mainland learns from the world's preoccupation and opposition to aggression that it's time to have a sweeter policy toward Taiwan. And I hope Taiwan will learn to reciprocate. But I don't want to anticipate. I just want to introduce uh, my dear friend, Professor, and I should say Professor, because he's also done a lot to stimulate public international law education in Taiwan since he left office. But I just want to give him now the platform. And if you'll talk for a while, then we could have a conversation, including the audience. Of course. Okay. Please. <laughs> Professor Cohen, distinguished guests, professors, students, and everyone. Good afternoon. First of all, uh, I think I should introduce myself first. <laughs> My name is Ma Yinjiu. I was born in Hong Kong in 1950 and moved in 1951 uh, to Taiwan. I grew up where I grew up. I obtained my bachelor's, master's, and doctorate, uh, doctorate law degrees from National Taiwan University, NYU, and Harvard University Law School. And uh, uh, in 72, 76, and 81, uh, <clears throat> spreading, uh, spending two years in the uh, ROC Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, and uh, uh, today, I'm very delighted to return to NYU Law School. I want to ex express my profound gratitude to my uh, uh, mentors, such as Professor Jeremy Cohen, Andrew Lowenfeld, for their tireless guidance in many aspects. What makes more uh, interesting 
is that uh, on March 1st, 1976, upon my graduation from NYU Law School, the law school's vice dean, George E. Zetley, sent me a congratulatory letter saying, Dear Mr. Ma, New York University School of Law doesn't award advanced degrees with honors, but an examination of your outstanding academic record prompts me to offer congratulations on the quality of your performance in the graduate program. I hope that your experience at the school has been pleasant and helpful. Upon reading this letter, I was pleasantly surprised and greatly moved. I felt that my life at NYU Law School was indeed helpful because I got an advanced degree of law, LLM, and, and met many good professors. It is also pleasant because I met a lovely girl, Christine, from Taiwan, who became my wife three years later. <laughs> we have two, two daughters, and the older one, Leslie, also went to NYU to focus on museum studies after she graduated from Harvard and now works at the Metropolitan Museum of Art as an associate pr proctor. After she got her PhD in art history in University of California at uh, San Diego. So I will give you the law school a copy of this letter uh, as king sake. After my return to Taiwan in 1981, I serve as uh, an assistant and English interpreter for the late president, Jiang Jingguo, and later served as a vice chairman of the Mainland Affairs Council in charge of cross-ray affairs. Uh, and the uh, Minister of Justice. In 1998, I successfully ran for mayor of Taipei, and I was re-elected in 2002, serving as Taipei mayor for a total of eight years. In 2008, I was elected the 12th president of the Republic of China on Taiwan with the highest uh, percentage of votes, 58%. I was re-elected for a second term, the 13th term in 2012. My accomplishment during my time in office included promoting and enforcing clean and efficient government, cracking down on corruption, vote buying, my piao, in elections, and organized crime protecting the right, rights of women and marginalized groups by incorporating five international human rights conventions which the ROC was unable to join for political reasons into a domestic law by inf uh, normal uh, legislative process. We brought the Uh, oh, by the way, um, Professor Cohen also, also helped me on that. You remember that you came to Taiwan to review the process, the, the progress. That was a great innovation you did. Yeah. Uh, so during the interval, uh, they, uh, they, they are, during these eight years, the number of countries that granted visa-free entry to ROC nationals increased from 54 to 164, tripling the previous uh, count. During my eight years in office, Taiwan and mainland China signed 23 agreements, including the Heavyweight Cross-Strait Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, ECFA, paving the way for a peaceful and prosperous cross-strait relations. 20 uh, two-way trade reached 350 billion US dollars with Taiwan having 150 billion trade surplus. Uh, men and students used to be only uh, 800 in Taiwan, but they increased to 42,000, up 50 times. Taiwan students studying in the Chinese mainland uh, it's from a few hundred 
to 12,000. It's about up 40 times. And so uh, this is a period when the two sides interact with the other side very frequently and warmly. On November 7, 2015, I had a historic summit meeting in Singapore with President Xi Jinping of mainland China. This marked the first meeting between leaders from both sides of Taiwan Strait since the separation across the Taiwan Strait in 1949. Spanning 66 years, during the meeting, we reaffirmed the 1992 consensus as our common political uh, foundation, agreed to peacefully resolve our dispute, and demonstrated the peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait are achievable. At the time, The Economist, a British weekly, described this as the most significant concession made by mainland China on sovereignty issues to Taiwan since the 1980s. However, everything changed when I stepped down from office in 2016. With the inauguration of President Tsai Ing-wen, tension across the Taiwan Strait reached unprecedented levels. In May 2021, the Economist featured a cover story with the headline, Taiwan has become the most dangerous place on Earth. So the same magazine had a significant different perspective on Taiwan's security and stability over a period of only six years. I'm here today at New York, NYU to offer insights based on my eight years of experience as the president of the Republic of China and my seven years of of observations of Taiwan since leaving office. My goal, my goal is to provide recommendations for relevant parties on how cross-strait relations can shift from Taiwan being the most dangerous place on Earth, as it was described by the economists, back to the peace, stability, and prosperity that characterize my presidency. I have two specific recommendations. My first recommendation is that Taiwan's leaders must strictly adhere to the Constitution of the Republic of China and the act go governing relations between the peoples of the Taiwan area and to the uh, mainland area. The, the, the act I mentioned in Chinese, Liang An Ren Ming Guan Xi Tiao Li. This means returning to the common political foundation that existed during my tenure, which is the 92. 1992 consensus, meaning one China, respective interpretations. Only through the consensus can mutual trust be restored between Taiwan and mainland China, and tensions across Taiwan Strait <coughs> can be reduced. At the same time, mainland China should also exercise patience and cease military and quasi-military actions that threaten the use of force in order to reassure the people of Taiwan. On November 16, 1992, a new era began to emerge in cross strait relations with the establishment of the 1992 consensus. According to the uh, consensus, both sides of the Taiwan Strait adhere to the one China principle pursuant to their respective constitutions. However, they can verbally express the different interpretations of one China, which constitute the essence of the consensus, meaning seeking common, common ground while respecting differences. Because of the 92 consensus, Taiwan and mainland China were able to sign 23 agreements covering almost all walks of life. All my ministers, my ministers during my tenure as president had direct and corresponding communication with their mainland Chinese Counterparts to address issues of mutual concern. So next so Taiwan and Taiwan Through this approach, we were able to overcome many of the challenges we face. So the existence of the 92 consensus serves as a guardrail for cross-strait peace. However, since I left office, the subsequent Democratic Part Progressive Party DPP government has consistently rejected the 92 consensus, which may escalate tension across the Taiwan Strait, making the future of cross-strait peace even more uncertain. 
the up upcoming presidential election in January 24 is therefore crucial. If the new president is willing to accept the 1992 consensus, the possibility of cross-strip cheese becomes likely and viable. My second recommendation is that countries that are friendly to the ROC, including the United States and the other Western countries, should encourage the ROC's leaders to seek mutual trust and engage in dialogue with men in China, rather than encouraging Taiwan's leaders, currently, currently the, back, the Democratic Progress Party, to move toward Taiwan independence or even transforming Taiwan into a second Ukraine. In Western society recently, there is saying that today is your, today's Ukraine is tomorrow's Taiwan. This is absolutely wrong. Taiwan is not Ukraine. It can never be Ukraine. And cross-strait relations differ greatly from Russian-Ukraine relations. Russian and Ukraine are two independent countries, while Taiwan and mainland China are not under their own constitution. After the separation across the Taiwan Strait that started in 1949, which sides maintained one China principle uh, in their respective constitution. For the Republic of China on Taiwan, the China as defined in the constitution reverts to the Republic of China itself. According to the respective constitutions on both sides, cross-strait relations are not relations between two countries, but between two regions. Taiwan region and the mainland region of one China, which are fundamentally different. Our constitution as well as the mainland's constitution affirms that cross-strait relations do not involve two separate countries and have room for the possibility of future integration, which distinguishes it from the Russian-Ukraine relationship. The current ruling party, President Tsai Ing-wen, the Democratic Progressive Party, has since 2021 repeatedly claimed that the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China are not subordinate to each other. Uh, they have also changed the Republic of China National Day to Taiwan National Day. In the billboards during the, the National Day celebrations in the last three years, this year included, these statements are in violation of our constitution and are seen as provocative toward cross-strait relations, potentially escalating tensions and deterioration. President Tsai's actions are effectively signaling a move toward Taiwan independence on the international stage, which poses the risk of dangerous military conflict across the Taiwan Strait. And this is the stance openly opposed by countries including the United States, Europe, and Japan, and the majority of the Taiwan people. However, I have noticed that the deteriorating relationship between the United States and mainland China has provided room for Tsai Ing-wen government, uh, the Taiwan independence agenda, to develop, especially recent statements and positions from some individuals in the United States have shown a tendency to turn Taiwan into a second Ukraine. I must strongly emphasize that the people of Taiwan vehemently oppose such assertions and actions. For example, this year, comments from former U.S. officials, congressional members, and some think tank reports have almost uniformly mentioned the, st the shocking idea of destroying TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, Taiji Diangongsi, a semiconductor giant in the world, in advance to prevent it from falling into the hands of communist men in China. The idea has deeply unsettled the people of Taiwan. Even former U.S. National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien has also advocated for the Taiwan government to issue, to issue an AK-47 rifle to everyone as a preparation for countering the invading mainland China forces in the city. The vast majority of Taiwanese people consider this a, a ludicrous and imaginative suggestion. Besides, as a former Marine, I would, I would say, the rifle being used by the ROC forces, namely T-91, is as good as M-16 used by the American forces. They don't need the AK-47 to defend Taiwan. I must solemnly emphasize that while we appreciate 
the support of our American friends. We do not welcome this thinking that completely dis disregards the real situation in Taiwan, ignores cross-strait relations, or even considers the weaponization of Taiwan. I believe that the best way to prevent further escalation of tension between the United States and China, which could impact the global order, is for the United States and Western society to encourage peace negotiating between Taiwan and mainland China. This approach aims to prevent a conflict in the Taiwan Strait. The United States should play a role in encouraging dialogue between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait and seek and seeking peace. Those individuals who view Taiwan as a weapon and intend to turn one, Taiwan into a battlefield without considering the safety and well-being of the Taiwanese people, as well as those who replace facts with rumors and interfere in Taiwan's elections, are highly un un unwelcome to the people of Taiwan. The U.S. government should strongly intervene to prevent such unfriendly actions or rumors from spreading. In fact, there is a lot of room for dialogue and cooperation between the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. On March 27, 2023, this year, I led a group of 30 Taiwanese university students and two professors on a 12-day visit to mainland China. During the visit, I not only pay respect to my ancestors in, this, in his home in Hunan province, but we also engage in academic exchanges with Hunan, uh, uh, Wuhan, Hunan, and Fudan universities. This marked the first visit of Men in China by a retired president of the Republic of China. Throughout the visit, many domestic and international communicators, uh, commentators, view our journey as a new chapter in cross-strait exchanges, easing the, test, easing the tension in cross-strait relations in recent years and sending a message of peace to the entire region and world. In mid-July this year, we also invited 37 men and Chinese students to visit Taiwan. In addition to the three universities mentioned earlier, we expanded the list to include Beijing University and Tsinghua University, led by former President Pat, uh, Hao Ping of Beijing University. This visit was highly successful and enabled further exchanges between students from both sides. The future of cross relations belongs to the younger generation, after all. When young people from both sides increase their mutual understanding and friendship, the risk of war and conflict is inevitably reduced. These two visits have effectively reduced the tension and conf confrontation that have prevailed across the Taiwan Strait for the last seven years since the DPP came to power. They have also drawn international attention to the fact that cross-strait relations do not necessarily have to lead to armed conflict and that peaceful outcomes are, un, are attainable through engagement. In fact, during my visit to mainland China, opinion polls in Taiwan indicated that 77% of the people supported my decision to visit mainland China. This is ample proof that the people of Taiwan yearn for return to peace, stability, and prosperity in cross relations. Earlier this month, I went to Singapore to participate in a forum uh, commemorating former Prime Minister Li Guangyao, where Prime Minister Li Xianlong invited me to share my thoughts. I emphasized the importance of inviting representatives from both sides of the Taiwan Strait to engage in dialogue and attempt to find peaceful solutions. This is a fantastic opportunity to enhance mutual understanding. If Taiwan and mainland China can reach some sort of consensus, it may also reduce conflict between mainland China and the United States. Upon finishing my speech, the audience erupted in enthusiastic applause, indicating a strong agreement with this idea. In Singapore, I once again urge Western countries to encourage Taiwan and mainland to engage in dialogue on how to address the current sense at the current tense situation. I hope that people who are ab about this situation, who, who, who care about this situation, not only in Asia, but all around the world, can and should encourage Taiwan and the mainland to uh, resume dialogue and find a solution. 
During my eight-year presidency from 2008 to 2016, no country in the world believed that there would be a war across Taiwan Strait. From my experience in office, it is clear that cross-strait peace is entirely possible. I hope that in the Republic of China, next year's presidential election in January, the president elected by the people of Taiwan can chart a path that opposes Taiwan independence, seek peace, and avoids war. I believe this is the most essential development needed in the world right now, so that Taiwan cannot become a second Ukraine. Thank you very much. Well, that was a remarkable talk. I hope it will be made available in print so that we can study all the niceties uh, involved. And I hope that your government office here in New York can make that available to the press. It's a very important statement. The first thing I was struck by is last Thursday, I published an op-ed with Ms. Chun Yuja from Taiwan mm. on this subject and how similar my points were but I also recognize some of the problems here. What are the positions of the candidates today? Uh, does Mr. Ho adopt your view we should revive the uh, One China principle? And what does the opposition say about it? Is the election going to be a forum for determining whether you're right when you say the Taiwan people really want to have this reach out to the mainland. What do you think? What are the candidates' positions now? Well, as you know, the KMT's candidate, Hou Youyi, has already uh, publicly declared he will follow my uh, uh, ideas of uh, no unification, no independence, and no use of war, which I use during my presidential elections. And also, he supports our idea in the uh, uh, 92 consensus, one China, respective interpretations. So by and large, he follows uh, the uh, political ideas that I uh, upheld in the last 20 years. So, so we have a lot of trust in him. But of course, his situation is rather tense. Well, there are three or four candidates running for one position. <coughs> Well, will the other candidates fold their tent into the Guomindang before the election? In other words, the Dr. Ka, mm -hmm. is he going to give up and say his supporters should vote for the KMT? Well, they are at the, at the moment three <coughs> KMT candidates. They are negotiating with their, each other whether they could have a, a sort of some kind of a joint coalition. But uh, uh, we, we still have to watch how far they can go. Because I wonder whether the election coming up should be regarded as a test of what the people of Taiwan want for a mainland policy, mm -hmm. or whether there are other issues involved, and maybe local questions uh, that will really be decisive. Mm -hmm. How do you evaluate the importance of the mainland question to the election? It is one of the uh, very important issues in the uh, election because uh, the other candidate from the Democratic Progressive Party, uh, Min Jindang, Lai Jinder, he supports uh, uh, Taiwan independence and he considers himself a pragmatic uh, uh, worker of Taiwan independence. I once, I once commented, commented that uh, that's a little bit uh, strange because Taiwan independence itself is not uh, an, uh, uh, mm. <coughs> very, uh, uh, how do we say that? Uh, uh, how do we say that? Uh, uh, how do we say that? Uh, uh, yeah, Taidu from the very beginning is not Wushu. <laughs> you see, Many people feel that the popular vote in Taiwan would reject a resurrection of your previous successful policy. 
Uh, how do you view what happened to your last attempt that led to the Sunflower Movement? That's something a little different. Sunflower focused on uh, the, the service trade, but they didn't have their own uh, idea at all. And uh, but, uh, but particularly in the end, some sub supporters of the movement actually uh, find each other. And uh, uh, so I don't believe that is a very successful student movement. Do you think that Xi Jinping is willing to accept a resurrection of your one China principle, or will he think the time for that is too late, it's past? How do we know they'll go for it? I argued the other day in my uh, piece in the Hill newspaper that Xi Jinping's policy toward Taiwan is a failure and he ought to reconsider and try to be much more open and instead of being threatening, being welcoming to cooperation. But do you think he's willing to make that kind of change or is he unwilling to alter the current threatening policy? Uh, of course, in his view, he said he supports peaceful unification, but he will never uh, uh, go without the not peaceful unification. In other words, they still think uh, power is very important. But until today, we're not so sure what uh, their general uh, attitude toward the opinions of the candidates. But obviously, they will not support Taiwan independence. But as far as uh, Hou Yi is concerned, I think we probably should have to wait for a while to see wh how their rea reactions are to his most recent uh, uh, ideas. Mm -hmm. Of course, a candidate live for the DPP says he's not advocating independence now for Taiwan. He's trying to walk back some of his earlier statements. Mm -hmm. uh, he says he'll try, it looks like, to renew the Tsai policy of she refuses to utter the one China words, but says in substance she wants to have cooperation. Uh, do you think that we can see any change in Lai's policy in the future? I don't think they will change. Mm -hmm. Because they said it already, that uh, uh, Taiwan independence means war. So I, I'm sure they wouldn't, they wouldn't change. I want to open this while we're still talking about cross-strait relations. But before that, I want to emphasize what President Ma has done with respect to questions of human rights and the rule of law and international law in Taiwan. He mentioned earlier an experts committee of foreign specialists in human rights that he organized because Taiwan is denied the opportunity to take part in the United Nations review of various human rights actions. And instead, he created very imaginatively Taiwan's own international committee to do a better job than the UN review committees usually do. And I had the pleasure for two times coming out for a week each time and reviewing Taiwan's progress. I don't think we should forget that. And of course, we shouldn't forget the current work he's been doing on promotion of public international law. But I'd like to see, are there questions here? I've seen some written questions people have submitted. They're all pretty similar. They revolve around the obvious questions that we've started talking about here. But is there anyone who wants to start off? There's a microphone uh, right here. Yes, what? yes, yes, right here. Go ahead, please, please Hi. make um, your questions loud and short. 
Yes, I'm not sure this mic works. Does it work? I hear you. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Professor Ma, welcome back to NYU. I'm an undergraduate here. I also an incoming law student at Harvard Law School. So it's wonderful to see you in person. I wanted to ask you about one particular idea, the idea of asymmetric warfare. Uh, a former chief of the general staff, Li Ximing, has been aggressively pushing for this idea of having a porcupine or as asymmetric warfare as part of Taiwan strategy. What do you think of the idea? And do you think that is, in a sense, more effective in terms of deterrence that, as he suggested? Thank you. Asymmetric warfare. That's a highly technical military question. But <laughs> asymmetrical <laughs> warfare. He wants oh. the match. <laughs> so do you think uh, Taiwan should not adopt that strategy? I don't think so, no. But what, what is your personal perspective on that? Well, I don't think we have uh, many choices. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Men in China is much stronger, not much bigger than Taiwan. So we have to handle the situation very carefully. But as a lawyer myself, I think the best solution is that we try to do it peacefully. We try to uh, use peaceful means to achieve the peace. Uh, I met him once, and I also uh, tried to let him know that settled dispute by peaceful means is actually the, the reason why United Nations was created. We have to try to reduce war as much as possible. I don't know whether he listens carefully, but at least I, I let him know Taiwan is very interested in peaceful settlement of disputes. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, President Ma, I, I have roots in China. I have roots in Taiwan. And my daughter works here at NYU Law School for many years. Uh, I teach here myself, by the way. Uh, my question is, in recent months, there's been some uh, controversy which creates tension as the US legislators, such as Nancy Pelosi and others, uh, visited Taiwan, high profile visit. In your view, visits such as this should be encouraged, discouraged, or otherwise? Pelosi's visit is quite controversial in Taiwan. And many people uh, suggest that uh, the United States should reconsider the kind of uh, visit. That wouldn't help the cross trade relations at all. Of course, it's very controversial here also, although fewer people uh, focus on it. And, uh, but it does raise the general question that you alluded to in your remarks about it. How do we show our support for Taiwan in a way that will not unnecessarily alienate or irritate the PRC? There is a difference between, I think, uh, putting our own troops or trying to make another defense agreement with Taiwan. All of that is plainly off the chart. Mm -hmm. But there's much we can do without violating the understanding of the Shanghai communique. But many people in Congress don't understand that, as you uh, indicated. Yes, sir, please. Uh, Professor Mar, uh, welcome back to NYU. And uh, to be frank, my name is Frank. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a student at Columbia University now, but I graduated from NYU last year. Uh, I know you and your uh, wife fell in love at NYU. I met my girlfriend here. <laughs> and uh, she's a she's, uh, NYU law student now, uh, second year. And my, these are hard questions. My question could be, I think it's easier. So we see a lot of young faces here, uh, I believe, from both uh, Taiwan, mainland China. So my question is, uh, how do you believe young generations can contribute to positive cross-strait relations? And thank you. Well, that's a very good question. I think you all should be concerned about cross-strait relations and all support the idea of settle the dispute peacefully. And this is probably the only way out. What should they do concretely? Are there steps that can be taken to improve exchanges? You've been trying on a one-man basis, <laughs> but is there more that should be done institutionally uh, in order to improve the understanding of young people on both sides? I think engagement is probably the first step you should take. This is why I organized visit by 
Taiwanese young people to mainland and vice versa. I think when they get to know the issues and spread out, I think it will work eventually. Otherwise, uh, if you don't do something like this, you will just sit there idly waiting for the result. So for some of you, I'm sure some of you will be very interested in the organized visit to mainland China and that the young people there understand if we really want to solve the problem without bloodshed, we have to do it quick. Do you think the young people of China have the power to influence their government? Well, gradually. <laughs> no, I don't think they can do it now. But we have to do things like that gradually. If you think it's, it's fertile to do that, then nothing will happen. I don't think the question is so ridiculous as the audience response indicates. When you think of the brief opposition of the young people in China to some of the overly repressive measures taken to stop COVID, that was a very encouraging step. And it may be that there are many parents of young people who are themselves increasingly willing to at least talk about opposition to some of the government policies. I don't know. We are not permitted to know. That's why it's hard enough, of course, to know what public opinion thinks in this country or Taiwan. But when you try to tell what public opinion really thinks in China, that's quite a task. Uh, hello, President Ma. Uh, I'm Lin Shi Yuan Stanley. Uh, I also, I'm also a NTU graduate and currently study at NYU Law School. So I kind of follow your staff. Um, you have mentioned 1992 consensus for several times, and you mentioned that KMT uh, candidates Hou Youyi is also following uh, your staff. However, uh, KMT has experienced twice uh, devastating defeat in presidential election in 2016 and 2020. So are we expecting a third this year? Uh, especially recently, uh, Xi Jinping has not only once mentioned and emphasized that the core of 1992 consensus uh, is the one China principle, which is quite different than yours. Can we also call that the consensus? Or, um, and on what grounds do you think that Chinese people could still uh, live in a life and, uh, of freedom and democracy uh, under that one China principle and the 1992 consensus? And my second part of question was related to submarine. As the war you mentioned, that Taiwan has recently launched a new domestically made submarine, uh, which against all obstacles. But actually, Taiwan could not experience those struggles because Bush administration they agreed to sell eight diesel submarines to Taiwan. However, KMT, at, under your leadership, then uh, they refused and blocked such a uh, budget act from entering. Uh, the legislative UN, Taiwan's Congress, in the procedural committee at the end. So and you mentioned proudly, there's still a video tape of your speaking, uh, your words on the YouTube that uh, you have blocked the, the bill for 59, uh, for, for, to a astonished number of 69 times. And you see as an evidence for you to be a strong and resolute politician. So my question is why you, under your leadership, why are you blocking that uh, bill from, um, uh, uh, a defective debate in the Congress, you'd not even allow it to put on the agenda, but block it in uh, the procedural committee. Will you reconsider it now? Thank you. <laughs> it's quite a question. <laughs> That's why. What is your question? <laughs> Do you understand the question, apparently? <laughs> <laughs> He's accused you of blocking a bill 59 times. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that was? Mm -hmm. Should I explain it? To talk to yeah. Make it short okay. and clear. Um, <laughs> U.S. once agreed to sell Taiwan a diesel submarine during the Bush administration, and then you were the chairman of KMT, and you blocked the such budget act for Taiwanese government to purchase the diesel submarine in the procedural committee of the Congress, meaning that 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 bill could not even put on the agenda to be discussed and fully debated in Taiwan's Congress, the Legislative UN. And I'm wondering why your, you or your uh, party were afraid of having a debate with the ruling party then, 
And while blocking uh, Taiwan from acquiring such important self-defense weapon uh, against a strong military power. You are not, and I would like to make myself clear, you are not blocking it in the debate uh, in the Assembly of Congress, but blocking it in the procedure committee. And for 69 times. Now it's 69. And, yeah, and you proudly mention it. Yeah. Okay, I'll finish quickly. And I think you probably mentioned it. So I was wondering, uh, could you explain more why you do this? And don't you think that summary is important for Taiwan self defense? Thank you. <laughs> Say yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, okay. But before his predecessor, the President Chen, at that time, Bush administration already agreed to sell. This is not wrong information. I'm sorry to, I'm, I'm, it's regrettable to hear that. Next question. All right. Um, hi, I'm a law student here, um, and I'm from Hong Kong. Um, so I find it very interesting that in your remarks you talked a lot about what the U.S. did or what the DPP has done and what you did during your tenure, but not how the Chinese government has changed since the uh, 1992. And as a person from um, Hong Kong, I would want to um, offer you the opportunity to fill that piece in um, to talk about or comment on um, China's um, turn towards authoritarianism since... Um, uh, the current president and how that would um, impact uh, Taiwan and the Taiwanese people. You're oh, right. Mm. Mainland China is a totalitarian government. But when I was president of the Republic of China, my strategy is to engage and try to gradually develop friendship and trying to change the idea. If you want to fight with them, you're not going to get a result. But remember, mm. During my uh, presidency, we concluded 23 agreement with the mainland. And this is a very important step to, to keep the two sides together and gradually make the other side understand what our policy and what our attitude is. Well, for dealing an uh, entity of mainland China, it takes a long time. And it takes a lot of effort. There's no simple solution. So that's what I did is engagement, engagement, and engagement. Gradually changed the situation. Do you think they've changed? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Ma, for coming. I'm a law student here. Over the past few years, the PRC has increased its diplomatic isolation of Taiwan, uh, both switching its Central American allies' recognition as well as isolating it from certain international organizations like the WHO. Additionally, uh, the People's Liberation Air Force has increased its sorties violating Taiwan's air defense identification zone. How have these belligerent or provocative actions affected the Taiwanese uh, own notions that the PRC actually does want a peaceful settlement of the uh, two straight crisis? That's a point, of course, I raised the other day uh, in the uh, essay in The Hill. Uh, things have changed now. You have since 2020 the suppression of Hong Kong. You have more and more incidents in the South China Sea. Uh, you have a continuing world protest against the mistreatment uh, of uh, people uh, in Xinjiang. Uh, that's all changed the popular perception in the United States. That's why it's so popular to come out against communist China. Every politician wants to do that now in the United States. Do you see it possible that things might moderate in China? And what could cause that to happen? I'm a believer in reason in demonstrating the defects of current policy and hoping people will realize that. Is Xi Jinping open to that? Deng Xiaoping was open to that. Many other communist leaders were rather practical. 
Xi Jinping seems more ideological, more unforgiving. Uh, do we have to live with him in 10, 20 more years? <laughs> <laughs> or is he likely is he likely to change because Chinese, even communist leaders, are often practical people? You've met him. You know more about this than <laughs> most of us. Do you have a view on this? Well, uh, since the day I joined the work of uh, Menon Relations, I understand this is a very tough job, and uh, you're not you not be. It's not very easy to get any results, but you could do it continuously, gradually making people understand. This is probably what we are doing is probably the, the best way to make the two sides together. Now, you know, in Taiwan, people do have different ideas, but for Taiwan and the mainland, we already have a very close relationship in trade and education and other things. No, we, we, I think this kind of uh, engagement works, make people gradually understand. It's, it's not something that uh, you, you do it and you get a result tomorrow. You have to be patient. Well, they have to permit it, and we have to offer it in many different ways, right. which we seem to have tired of doing now. Mm -hmm. We have many fewer American students in China looking for opportunities. When I think back to what it was like in 1971, when any of us working on China, we tried every conceivable fashion to get into the mainland mm -hmm. and start interacting. And then we succeeded with all kinds of opportunities. And now it's fading away. And I think it's unfortunate that we've been losing interest in learning more about China, but it's also very unfortunate that they do a lot uh, to discourage us. And of course, US immigration policy is not easy for people from China to come here now. So I think there's a lot to be learned on both sides. Yes, please. Yes. Hi, President Ma. My name is Wang Mingyu. I'm a grad student here. I'm from Shandong, China, um, and Weihai City. And uh, my question really is, uh, from the fragmented information I can access to in the past few years in Chinese social media, Bilibili, Douyin, which is Chinese TikTok, and Xiaohongshu, there's a lot more comment and even content creators from Taiwan. And for those who are not familiar, as a measure to counter cyber violence, uh, when you put comment in Chinese social media, it shows where you are posting it from. So yes, and, uh, and also, there's more comment um, telling that they are sm they, uh, those Chinese social media are having growing popularity and, um, uh, and influence in Taiwan for people who even just live in Taiwan. Yes, and uh, given the fact that in the past two to three decades, the DPP dominant traditional media shows a poll number that the public opinion towards mainland China are mostly neutral to negative. So, in the past, especially in the past decades. So in your opinion, uh, with this more presence of Chinese social media in Taiwan, do you personally see any shift in public opinion towards mainland China? And uh, do you think, if we're looking for something like, like a change in the electoral result, do we have to wait until the newer generation of voters to grow up, like those who, who are born after 2005, who are growing with this prevailing influence from Chinese social media. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, it, it's always a very difficult question to answer. Made in China is so big, so powerful, and so many people, they won't change overnight. You have to be patient, and you have to do it uh, persistently. Otherwise, you won't get any result. Now, when I went to Made in China uh, in uh, late March and early April, for 12 days. And everywhere we went, we saw crowds welcoming us. And I was very much surprised. And uh, uh, a lot of people, local people tell, tell us they had never seen that before. I think this is good. We, we would do more of this, getting more context and let them understand. I think things will change. 
you know, people are, are joking. They said, uh, Mr. Ma, you should go to mainland China and uh, have the election over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, but I, I do think uh, my trip to the mainland gives me more confidence that uh, mainland China will change eventually. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this place is full of vitality mm -hmm. and full of uh, uh, thinking, and I think, so uh, I have confidence that gradually it will change. Yeah, thank you, sir. And may uh, I just what, you mean, ask you a quick follow-up question? from Shandong, question? right? Yes, Shandong, yes. How long have you been out of Benin, China? Uh, this is my fifth year out of, the, out of, the, out of China in the United States. Hmm. Uh, sir, may I just ask a quick follow-up question? So in that case, you, you didn't see much change in Taiwan's public opinion, even though there has been growing Chinese social media influence in at least for a couple of years, right? I, I, didn't quite, I didn't guess you. Uh, so, uh, the question is, uh, you do you think that in the past few years, the media has also influenced the Taiwan media in Taiwan? Or did you not see such a change? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I don't think any change in cross-relation relations would be very fast. You have to be uh, you're doing constantly and trying, trying, trying to find change gradually. It will never happen suddenly. But you have to do it persistently, otherwise you will see no results. Thank you, sir. So we've got to keep moving here because at 5.15 it's over. Go ahead, please. Hi, Professor Ma. My roots is also in Hunan, so it's a great pleasure to see you. And my question is, based on my understanding, uh, the concept of nationality is a kind of narrative. Currently, DDP is selling the uh, Taiwan independence to the public, to Taiwan citizens. And uh, from your perspective, apart from the uh, uh, unpragmatic, or so to say, unpractical, uh, is, there any, uh, is there anything wrong, or so to say, fallacy to the Taiwan independence theory from political or uh, cultural uh, aspect or whatsoever? Thank you. Well, uh, it Taiwan independence is an idea promoted uh, after uh, Japan left Taiwan. But gradually, well, the content of it also changed. And particularly after uh, democracy in Taiwan has already take root. And you, have, you could really achieve your political uh, ends with peaceful means without having to resort to Taiwan independence. And even today, look what uh, the, the current uh, presidential election. The DPP candidate, he said, he's, he is a pragmatic supporter of Taiwan independent, independence. I always joke that Taiwan independence itself is not uh, <laughs> pragmatic at all. But, uh, but anyway, in Taiwan, you have the freedom to advocate Taiwan independence, but it depends on the voter whether they'll support you. And so, so in Taiwan, you could say whatever you want to say. You have freedom of speech. So, and, but as far as Taiwan independence uh, is concerned, you have to look at what the reality is in Taiwan, how much the idea of Taiwan independence has already been practiced in our everyday life. So that is why I said uh, when Lai Qingde, the DPP candidate, st started his campaign, he tried to tone down Taiwan independence, he trying to let people understand, you know, he's not the kind of Taiwan independence that people don't like. Most people in Taiwan seem to want no change. They don't want to take any risks with formal independence, but they certainly don't want to come under the mainland. And the current status quo is pretty good. The question is, can it last? long enough until things improve on the mainland. Because ultimately, it's possible for Taiwan and the mainland to work out some relationships, mm -hmm. as you have uh, often abdicated. But you have to have a leadership in the mainland that right now is not ready for it. But I think the people of Taiwan 
don't want to take much chance with formal independence. It would be ridiculous. And it would be ridiculous for them to want to come under mainland rule with one country, two systems. So the art is how do we maintain peaceful relations over the next few decades till things can moderate and change on the mainland. Mm -hmm. Next, please. I'm a grad student from uh, International Relations Department. Just a quick question. So um, on the Chai's, uh, President Tsai's regimes, there were actually nine states which caught, off, uh, caught diplomatic ties with Taiwan. So obviously, the conditions getting even worse. And what would be the um, possible consequences of this deteriorating uh, diplomatic relationships to Taiwan? I don't quite get your question. I mean, like for example, Paraguay is considering to uh, cut diplomatic relationships with, Ta with Taiwan, right? And um, I mean, I mean diplomatic the, relations. Yeah, I mean, what's the consequences of this deteriorating diplomatic relations to Taiwan? You mean the absence of formal diplomatic relations? Yeah. I mean, yeah. What formal. difference does it make? In other words, can Taiwan have a adequate international relationship without the usual traditional formal yeah. diplomatic relationships yeah, with most countries? Well, at the moment, uh, the Republic of China has uh, 14 countries that have the formal diplomatic relations with us. But mainland China tried everything possible to take them out. And uh, so when I became president, Taiwan has a diplomatic relation with uh, 23 countries. And, uh, but uh, during my rule, I only lost one country, Gambia. But in this uh, DPP president, she lost nine. So this is something uh, very difficult to uh, to conquer because the mainland China has a lot of uh, 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 resources to attract some of the countries in the third world. So that will happen. But on the other hand, we we, we still be able to keep some. So it, it's a. But his question is a good one. How important is it to maintain? these formal relations, when there are other ways nations are finding to cooperate with Taiwan and support Taiwan now? It, it is an important question to maintain formal relations so that you could get the support in some cases which require formal uh, relations. Not everyone, but it works. So we, that is why we still try to keep as many uh, formal diplomatic uh, partners as possible, although it's very difficult. Let's have the last question here, please, or two. If you hurry, we can get two in. Okay. Uh, hi, President Ma. Uh, welcome back to NYU Law. Um, I'm currently a international JD studying at NYU Law, and I'm originally from mainland China. Uh, and one thing that sort of struck me when uh, in your speech is that when you're talking about managing cross-strait relationships, you kind of mentioned this four words, which means like seeking common grounds. But sometimes it feels like the differences is more like irreconcilable, whether it's from media portrayal or from honestly the opinions in this room. So I, my question is, what is left on the common ground? Like what is left on the table? <laughs> well, as I said, um, the 92 consensus is uh, uh, keep the common ground, but uh, preserve several space for the, each one to develop his own ideas. And according to our experience in dealing with uh, the communists, this is probably the only way to uh, maintain the relations. So it still works, but it's difficult. Otherwise. But what yeah. else can you expect? So what is the common interest uh, between people from mainland China and people from Taiwan currently? Well, there are a lot of common interests, people-to-people -people contact. And uh, so we still have to maintain the relationship. But I think Taiwanese people also support the kind of uh, action. 
as, as I t t uh, went to mainland China uh, earlier this year, and we, we welcomed uh, mainland students coming to Taiwan. And the opinion, opinion polls indicate that 77% of the people in Taiwan support that. They may not be able to speak a lot of things uh, they, he doesn't understand, but he c clearly needs that we should have peace with the other side. And this is what I exactly to do. I don't know whether you, you read a special report after our visit to mainland China by Yuan Jian. Uh, <laughs> uh, what? Yeah, what? I think you're pointing out the greater need we have for more information about Taiwan. Yeah. Even though we all recognize now it's important, we don't know enough. We're ahead of where we used to be. Just not so many years ago, an American journalist asked a group of Americans, what do you think about Taiwan? And the answer was, we love Thai food. <laughs> So we've got to do better. So I hope your government group here, Tecro, et cetera, can make available your speech of today, uh, as well as the report you mentioned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Last Thank question, you. please. Good afternoon, President Ma. I'm, a, I'm Huang Zhenting. I also graduated from National Taiwan University Law School, and I'm now a JD student at NYU Law. And my question for you is, um, I'm wondering how, uh, why do you think the 92 consensus is still applicable today, especially in the past few decades, the political circumstances have changed significantly? And how do you ensure that this consensus will still bring prosperity and peace to Taiwan? Uh, and also, um, and also, how do you know that um, Taiwan will not become the next Hong Kong? Thank you. <laughs> Any other simple questions? <laughs> The 92 consensus, was it really a consensus or just a formula by which both sides said, look, we have to get on and try to do a few things together? Well, I think in 1992, we reached a consensus with the mainland on one China respective interpretations. In other words, we're trying to keep the common ground, but leave uh, the, the, the different opinions open. This is probably the only way to get along with each other. I still consider this is a good way to deal with the, with mainland. And if we don't have this, then what else can you do? It's very difficult. I want to say this has been a terrific program. The attendance, your willingness to stay here for the full time, the stimulus given to us by President Ma, it all means we've got to do more. We can't just ignore what happened today and drop the ball. I'd like to see many more activities here at NYU, between NYU and institutions in Taiwan and the mainland. And we have to work at that. And energetic, imaginative students can do a lot. Let me say a few words. I know some of you might be very disappointed that your question don't get answers, but that's, that's the world it is. <laughs> <laughs> you, you try everything possible to get the answer, but sometimes you succeed, sometimes you don't. But why would you do it? You keep trying. You know, it's very difficult, it's very difficult to deal with a big entity like men in China, but you still have to deal with them, particularly for those of us in Taiwan, we're so close to them, what else can you do? So try our best to engage and engage and engage, gradually change their attitude, and maybe someday we can really get together fine. Hope springs eternal in the human <laughs> breast. Man never is, but always to be blessed. We have to maintain optimism and energy, That's right. and I hope that President Ma can come back often and stay longer so we can take some serious steps toward what he's outlined. I will try my best. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you for your time.